to you today, or beginning to speak to you about the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible. And before we even get into its contents, we need to discuss a framework for interpretation, or how can we approach this book and begin to understand what it has to say. So what I want to uh, propose is that we treat the book of Revelation just like we treat any other book in the New Testament, and just read it and in, uh, for what it says. Just uh, take the position that the author knew what he was talking about, and what it says it is, it actually is. Now, the big problem we have in doing that is uh, the book of Revelation is one of the, I, I would say, the, the only book in the Bible that we come to with a preconceived idea that we already think we know what it's about. And so we come to it with a preconceived idea and we try to fit everything we read into that preconceived notion of what it is. And we force things into the, force the text into meanings that are really not in the, in the text. So what I want to propose is, as I said, treat the book of Revelation just as any other book in the New Testament. Now, when we read other books in the New Testament, we, first of all, uh, we have to do this. We consider, we read them in their historical setting. We read them in their historical context. In other words, uh, they, the books that, like Paul's epistle to the Romans, for instance, it was meaningful to the Romans. Paul didn't write the letter to the Romans with the idea in mind that it will mean nothing to them, but people living 2,000 years afterwards uh, will appreciate it. Paul wrote the book of Romans not to saints of all times and all ages and, and all epochs. He wrote it specifically to people he had in mind living in his day in Rome in the first century. He says in the beginning of the book of Romans, to the saints that be at Rome. So we expect what he had in mind to be intelligible, an intelligible message to convey a message to uh, the people living at his, in his day to whom it was addressed. We would call this the historical interpretation and understanding the text in its historical setting. Now that's the first level of interpretation. After we have considered it in that light, then we can move on to the second level of interpretation and say, what in this, let's just say, epistle to the Romans, what is it in this New Testament book that is universal spiritual truth applicable not just to the Romans in the first century, but to everyone at all times uh, that's just universally true? That's the spiritual application. Now. Often when we, when we read, we don't really think about that. We think about it unconsciously, perhaps. But I'm suggesting, especially in this book of Revelation, we have to deliberately adopt that as a position. We have to take the position that uh, what John wrote to the seven churches that be in Asia in the book of Revelation had to be meaningful to them. It had to be relevant to them. Otherwise, he would not have said it to them. See, he could have written the book of Revelation and said, this is just a writing... Uh, I don't know when it's going to happen uh, in the faraway future. It doesn't mean anything uh, to us today, but someday, somewhere, some, it'll mean something to someone. He doesn't do that. He addresses it specifically to seven churches that were real churches in his day, filled with real people, uh, and he pronounces blessings on those who read it, that he, he had the expectation that they would read it and understand it. Now, let's just take an example of what I'm talking about and, and see if you understand uh, the difference between these two ways of looking at it. Uh, if I took the book of Romans and applied the thinking that many people apply to the book of Revelation, I would be hopelessly confused. For instance, let me read you a passage from the book of Romans, Paul's epistle to the Romans, chapter 15, verse 23. But now, having no more place in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come to you, whensoever I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you. For I trust to see you in my journey, and to be brought on my way thitherward by you, if first I may be somewhat comforted and filled with your company. Now when Paul wrote these words uh, in his book of Romans, 15, uh, chapter 15, verses 23 and 24, and he said twice, I am going to come to you, what would you think of me if I said to the people in our church here, if I said, now everybody get ready, uh, any day now the Apostle Paul is coming here. Well, how do you know? Well, he said so. It's right here in the Bible. That's God's Word, and it's speaking to me, and it says, Paul writes, I will come to you, and I've got God's Word for it, I've got the Bible for it. Paul says he will come to you, and that's me. Well, you would say, uh, you know, that's stupid, probably. And it is stupid. That is a, a silly way to read it, because we understand instinctively, when we read those passages, Romans chapter 15, verse 23 and 24, really, Paul is talking to those people to whom the letter was first addressed. He is planning to come to them. Uh, the, the Romans in the first century. And when we read that, we think, well, that's nice, he was planning to come to them. We don't assume that it means us as well. It would be wrong to assume that, because he's addressed this letter to saints that be at Rome, and he is planning uh, to come to them. So in its first interpretation, uh, Paul is saying, I am planning to come to you, saints in Rome. 
We don't think he's coming to us 2,000 years later. So, when I say that, does that mean that the book of Romans, Paul's epistle to the Romans, has no relevance? That we should just fold it up and never read it because it has no relevance to us? No, it has great relevance to us because it contains many spiritual truths. Uh, It contains a lot of spiritual truth that's universal, that applies not only to the saints in Rome in the first century, but also to us living 2,000 years after the fact. But we have to think about it. We have to interpret. We have to understand it. We have to sift out... Uh, what's written specifically and only to those saints that be at Rome, and what is universal spiritual truth. Like, for instance, Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's not true just for the Romans, that's true for us as well. Being justified freely by His grace, that's the next verse. That's not just the Romans that are justified freely by His grace, it's universally true for everybody. So when we come to the book of Revelation, let's think, first of all, about its historical context, and consider what it meant to those first recipients. It's not fair for us to read it and say, well, it just is addressing us today and it meant nothing to them. Listen, it has to be relevant to those first recipients or it's not a valid interpretation. I want to read to you uh, a passage from a book called The Parousia by a man named J. Stuart Russell. Uh, This was published in 1887. It's an analysis of the book of Revelation. And I think it's very pertinent and interesting what he says concerning uh, who the book is addressed to and what it must have meant and should be understood to have meant to those first recipients. He says, Was a book sent by an apostle to the churches of Asia Minor with a benediction on its readers, a mere unintelligible jargon, an inexplicable enigma to them? That can hardly be. Yet, if the book were meant to unveil the secrets of distant times, must it not of necessity have been unintelligible to its first readers? And not only unintelligible, but even irrelevant and useless to them, especially when we consider the actual circumstances of those early Christians, many of them enduring cruel sufferings and grievous persecutions, and all of them eagerly looking for an approaching hour of deliverance, which was now close at hand. What purpose could have been answered to send them a document which they were urged to read and ponder, uh, which was mainly occupied with historical events so distant as to be beyond the range of their sympathies and so obscure that even at this day the shrewdest critics are hardly agreed on any one point? Is it conceivable that an apostle would mock the suffering and persecuted Christians of his time with dark parables about distant ages? If this book were really intended to minister faith and comfort to the very persons to whom it was sent, it must unquestionably deal with matters in which they were practically and personally interested. And does not this very obvious consideration suggest the true key to the apocalypse? Must it not of necessity refer to matters of their contemporary history? The only tenable, the only reasonable hypothesis is that it was intended to be understood by its original hearers But this is as much to say that it must be occupied with events and transactions of their own day and those comprised within a comparatively brief space of time. Now, I think, to me, what he just said is self-evident truth. It can't really be argued. He's just saying that what's written in the book of Revelation, because it's addressed to, to seven specific churches, it must be relevant to them. Now, what's relevant to us today is what is spiritual truth that's contained in this book of Revelation. Uh, John is writing to people who were being persecuted, and he's writing to give them hope and comfort and encourage their faith. Uh, The Christians in the first century were living under extreme and terrible persecution. As Christians, they regarded Jesus as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But under the pressure of their trouble and their tribulation and their persecution, they would have been naturally tempted to doubt the reality of that fact, the fact that they were believing in. John is writing to encourage those first century believers by reminding them that Jesus is in fact Lord of Lords and King of Kings and very shortly would bring judgment upon their persecutors. Well, who were the persecutors of the first Christians? We think it's the Romans, but really the first persecutors of the Christians were not the Romans, but the Jews of the first century. Or I could say it this way, apostate Israel. Now having said that, has nothing to do with Jews in our day. This is not an anti-Semitic idea. has nothing to do with the nation of Israel in our day. It's talking about the nation of Israel in the first century. They were the first persecutors of the first Christians.